And if you look at climate change in its entirety, carbon and energy are the cause of climate change. Water is the consequence. We feel the consequences of climate change through our water supply. Welcome back to another episode of the Fifth Wall Climate Future World Vodcast, where we bring to you the latest advancement on climate tech and all things climate news related. Cedric, happy Thursday. We're going to talk about water theft and how it is uh, proving to be lucrative in a dangerously dry world. That bum, bum, bum. sounds like a James Bond movie. <laughs> Yeah, I think this, it is a James Bond movie. <laughs> this actually. is a James Bond movie. Quantum of Solace. There Water we go. scarcity, the mega drought in the West, right? So, so climate change essentially is is really impacting the water cycle, and affecting when and where and how much precipitation falls, especially here in the arid Western side of the United States. Um, other parts, you saw Europe went through some mega droughts um, as well. Do you remember seeing that where there, there's old markers, like drought markers, like rocks? in the river from you know hundreds of years ago that these cities used to put in and no one had seen them you know in hundreds of years and now all of a sudden they were visible because of the because of the droughts so we're actually going to bring on a very special guest today um, one we are very excited to have on named pat mulroy she has been dubbed the iron maiden or the water witch and has her hands in all things essentially that is going on around the Colorado River and water and was responsible for kind of the build out and growth of Las Vegas and and providing the water for them. So really excited to get her takes on all of this. All right, Pat, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Just for like the sake of our audience and even Cedric and I too, can you break down a little bit the water industry and how it works? Well, don't look for consistency. Let's start right there. <laughs> the water law on the East Coast and the water law on the West Coast live in completely different universes. The East Coast is riparian, which means if you own the land, you own the water that's beneath that land. In the West, you get the right to use it. You never really have an ownership interest in it. If you fail to use that resource for five consecutive years, the state can revoke your permit and take that water back. When you're a state like Nevada that has very little water resources, that makes all the sense in the world. Why would you let somebody file water right claims and then sit on them in perpetuity when they never intend to use it while others who need the resource can't access it, right? Sorry, is there like a minimum threshold or use case for the water rights? Like if a farmer needed it for irrigation versus like the Bellagio fountains, right? It's equal. Equal. It's equal. Municipal and ag are equal. In the state of Nevada, when it comes to Nevada water resources, mm -hmm. the Colorado River is different. In order to use Colorado River water in the lower basin, which is Nevada, California, and Arizona, you have to have a contract with the federal government. The water was divided in the lower basin between the states and any user within that state or the state itself had to enter into a contract with the federal, federal government to use that water. The water is essentially the people's water of the country, right? Mm -hmm. Most of your listeners probably don't know what the hell a <laughs> acre foot is, right? Yeah, can we talk about how it's the most confusing it's metric? Thousand <laughs> gallons. But to put it in perspective, so you get a sense of volume, 325 million acre feet a year go down the Mississippi River. 18 million max during wet years go down the Colorado River. The Columbia is 80 million. I mean, the Colorado is a pretty meager water supply, yet simultaneously, it supports um, over 40 million people, some of the most productive agricultural land in the country, the seventh largest economy in the world, some of the most pristine and treasured natural resources in the country, and a bevy of endangered species. So. There is a lot that depends on the Colorado River. 
The mistake they made in 1923, and you can't really fault them. I'm sitting here today with today's science and pointing the finger at them and saying, oh, look how good they were, really is kind of unfair. The best science they had at the time allowed them to look back 50 years, and those happened to be the 50 wettest years the system ever had. When you finally went in and looked at tree rings and looked at it over the centuries. Sitting here today, we know with climate change, we are looking at an average annual flow somewhere between 9 and 11 million acre feet a year. Yet you have users that are depending on a whole lot more than that. What has saved our bacon up to this point are the two reservoirs that got built. The system has two major storage reservoirs, Lake Powell, which sits behind Glen Canyon Dam, and Lake Mead, which sits behind Hoover Dam. When those reservoirs are gone, and when you look at the cumulative use, that's when things start getting difficult. Now, for the sake of the lower basin, and we're completely using our full allocation, or were until conservation's kicked in, the state of Wyoming is not using its full allocation. The state of Colorado is not using its full allocation. The state of Utah is not using its full allocation. New Mexico is, but they're the smallest user in the upper basin. So there was enough slough still in the system that we've been able to survive until today. D differently put, how do we continue like developing and, and urbanizing in a increasingly water scarce environment, you know, rising temperatures? How are we screwed or is there hope? How's Israel doing it? How's Saudi Arabia doing it? Desalination. How's Jordan doing it? I mean, we're not unique. Yeah. We're not the only desert dwellers on the planet. Let's be honest. And let to be very frank, when in 2002, when the drought really began and the reservoirs crashed, we were already taking 325,000 acre feet a year out of Lake Mead, consumptively. The ability to which we got through various agreements. By the time three years had passed, four years had passed, we had cut that by 40%, simply by going after outside use. Because if it's used inside, it doesn't matter. 93% of all wastewater is recycled. 90, it's either directly recycled or indirectly as a return flow credit. So it's a closed loop. You can keep adding as long as it's just inside use, right? Where you lose it is outside. So we started paying our customers. We started at a dollar per square foot to take grass out. The price has gone up and down depending on the demand. And I think it's sitting around $3 right now per square foot to take grass out because it's the single largest water guzzler in Southern Nevada. We had magnolia trees and oleanders and you name it, we had it. And everybody thought desert landscaping was rock, a cactus and a dead cow skull. There was no thought of, you know, indigenous landscaping or native plants or any of that. So we began that journey in about 2002 to change the community and it has been incredibly successful. We were surprised at how willing the community was in stepping up and changing out their landscaping. They were very willing to do it, but I also learned what not to do. Fountains are sacred in Southern Nevada. We even tried to draw a distinction between a fountain that had an economic nexus. For example, if I drain the canals in the Venetian, right? It's going to affect the tourism economy, right? If I shut the Bellagio fountain, it's going to affect the tourism economy. If I turn off the fountain in the parking lot of the shopping center where I go grocery shopping, and I got mad at Tinker's Dam because I'm going to go grocery shopping whether that fountain is on or not, right? People went berserk. Come lost their mind over the thought of losing their fountains. I decided it had to be that visceral cooling effect in the summer when it's 118 outside to have that sense of falling water. So given the tenacity of our then mayor, um, Oscar Goodman, we came up with this compromise that 
You can keep your fountain if you take out enough grass to equal 50 times the amount of water that that fountain uses consumptively annually. So they had to become a part of the solution. With that, nobody criticized fountains anymore. The other lesson I learned was never get between a senior citizen and his car washing schedule. There's <laughs> not a thing. Never would have guessed that. I no clue that it was this sacred ritual that old men did every week was to hand wash their precious car, that taking it to a car wash that recycles wasn't in the cards. We f I finally gave up. I was going to get flogged. So we finally gave up on that one. Said, fine, just put a shut off hose on it if you're going to insist on washing your car. So lessons learned, things we could do, things we couldn't do. At the, at the end, Las Vegas by five, six years was leading the nation in conservation. It had to. It wasn't a matter that we woke up one morning and decided we were going to be noble and um, really you know, sustainably smart, we were forced to, we had a gun to our head. However, we as a country, we have paralyzed ourselves. Environmental zealots have become a cottage industry. Their whole existence is to continue to make money, right? And that's why they file lawsuits. I mean, groups like the Center for Biodiversity made $47 million on filing lawsuits in one year. Why? Because the judges always award attorney fees, win, lose, or draw. It doesn't matter. So it's in their best interest to go to court. And what it's doing, it's going to push American civilization to the brink until something snaps and we say, wait a minute, we're not going to go under. We're smart enough. We know how to mitigate and avoid ecological disasters. We know we're going to have to spend a whole lot more money than we originally thought. We can't shortchange this. But when you weigh the seventh largest economy in the world against, I don't care, $10 billion, $20 billion worth of infrastructure, it pales. I mean, it's a no-brainer. And if you look at climate change in its entirety, carbon and energy are the cause of climate change. Water is the consequence. We feel the consequences of climate change through our water supply. So where we have to change and mitigate on the carbon side, we have to adapt on the water side. And we've done nothing around the adaptation piece. No, super well said. Without adaptation, essentially, the West is going to be hosed. My guess is that one day we are going, it'll become an act of Congress that changes it because I saw how that, how well that works. In, in terms of additional resources, do we need to do or um, create more reservoirs? Like, do we need more Lake Pals, Lake Meads? I think the way we store water may have to change because think about it. As the temperatures escalate, the evaporation rate escalates. So if you have open reservoirs, their utility becomes less effective because they're going to lose more to evaporation. So that's one thing, but should we be looking at raising dams, increasing storage? Yes, we should. And the whole mindset of how water facilities are built has to change. We've always had the mindset that if I invest capital in a particular facility, I have to use that facility 365 days a year so that I don't have a stranded investment. That doesn't work in a climate volatile world because water is going to come in various forms at unexpected times, in unexpected volumes, and you have to have the infrastructure to capture it when it's there to bridge you through the times when it's not. You have to be far more opportunistic. So you have to open your eyes and walk into this whole infrastructure realm saying, okay, this facility may only be used at full capacity one quarter of the time, but that one quarter of a time is going to be all critical 
for the community to be able to continue along in a normal course. One last question on our end here. The, this week was announced, at least in the news, right? The new Colorado River regulation. What, what are the hot takes on this? Who are the winners and losers? What, what should we be worried about with this uh, exactly new change? exactly what I expect. It's exactly, <laughs> it is exactly what I expected. The fact that the atmospheric rivers did come this last winter, the fact that the California reservoirs are full, the fact that Lake Powell is going to see an improvement and that Lake Mead is going to see an improvement, that what it calls for is 3 million acre feet of cuts over three years. That's a million a year. That <laughs> doesn't move the needle, yeah. right? But it's enough of a first step in the right direction to allow you to kick the can down the road until 2026. Had the atmospheric rivers not happened, it would have been a completely different story. Pat, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, oh, you're this very is welcome. yeah, this went really fast. Such insightful uh, nuggets. Yeah, it's centered. <laughs> <laughs> very symmetrical. All, very symmetrical. all forty-five minutes. <laughs> well, Pat, I feel like I need to just take you to dinner, and I want to hear all the stories. I want to see if. Cedric and I can get our surf pool approved for Las Vegas. We got to <laughs> <laughs> we got to uh, we got to talk about your mob boss stories. You talk about the transition from the you know family see, gaming I industry. I have to make you sign a non disclosure <laughs> agreement. I'll sign it. Yeah, I'll sign it. If she tells us, she'll have to kill us. <laughs> That's right. Show me the paperwork. I want to hear the stories. I'll sign it. <laughs> but we really appreciate you coming on. We appreciate all you're doing for the water world. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. This hour went really fast. Yeah. And and I will I'll close with I will I prefer to use your nickname Iron Maiden over <laughs> over the Water Witch. So I was thinking more about Water Whisperer. Water Whisperer. <laughs>